Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you for being here with us. Welcome to today's edition of Leading Well, Lemma's Practices and Insights. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and thank you for taking the time out of your busy, crazy, hectic schedules and whatever you're doing and it, it, at home and managing all the, all the craziness. I'm looking forward to a great conversation here today. We have Dr. Michael Woodward, who is clinical faculty at New York University. He is the chair at, of the Masters in Executive Coaching, so, uh, and, and also an organizational psychologist. And there's a Miami connection, we'll get to this here in a, in, in a little bit, but uh, welcome Dr. Woody. Hey, good to be here, man, thank you. So we, we wanna jump right into it. Um, just for those of you for context, just, uh, just before we do, uh, we started this uh, a couple of months ago and just as something to try out and to engage, engage with you and hear from you. Thank you for so, so many of the questions uh, that we received and thank you for those of you who are coming to us from all over the world. For the first one, we had folks from nine different countries. So uh, welcome, whether you have a connection, you know anything about the Center for Leadership or not, we're certainly glad you're here and we encourage you, if you can, connect with the center. We have uh, many things going on and new things coming up and we just posted, we just started a new series of uh, leadership quick shots on our LinkedIn page and as well as Twitter. And that will tell you a little bit about, uh, it, hear, have a chance to hear from some of our coaches and some of the people who are affiliated with the center in various ways to talk about just some of the things they're thinking about and some quick tips. Uh, I know the first one was really fantastic with uh, Dr. Stephanie May, which launched just a few days ago. So uh, please connect with us if you, uh, if you have a chance and look forward to, to great content. So uh, Michael Woodward. So uh, Woody is coming to us today uh, from Maryland, uh, where he uh, escaped uh, the, the greater New York area, I guess, uh, how many weeks ago? Tell us just a little bit about where, where you are, how you ended up where you are. Yeah, so I'm on week 11 in, uh, on Kent Island, Maryland, just uh, uh, a little uh, east of uh, Annapolis, Maryland, the, the capital of Maryland. So I actually grew up in this area and um, uh, our family's had a place down here since the late 70s, so since I was a very, very young child. Uh, but yeah, we, we live uh, right outside of Manhattan and uh, decided to flee when things started looking like it was going to go sideways back uh Back, uh, wow, in the uh, middle of March. So uh, it's been, we've been here through the change of seasons. And uh, you are, uh, so you're in New York, New York. Can you tell us a little bit about your, um, or you're based in New York. Can you tell us a little bit about your Florida connection? So if we say, not how did you end up here, but sort of metaphorically, how did you end up doing what you're doing now, now in, in this new role? As the, uh, as the chair of the uh, executive coaching program at NYU? Yeah, so uh, I did my PhD at FIU. Uh, and when you were a faculty in that program, uh, but before your uh, business school days, and uh, it was a great, great experience, fabulous program, and, and we had such a great cohort. I still keep in touch with a lot of those folks. But uh, prior to that, I'd actually did my undergrad at, at the, the other school down the road from uh, FIU. Uh, people might know University of Miami. Hey, so uh, we got love. We got love for UM too. Should, should have good love there. But uh, so I have love for both. But yeah, I uh, um, grew up spending a lot of time in Florida. I had family in Florida uh, ever since I was a young child and still do have family in Florida or in South Florida. So uh, I get back quite a bit. I've been involved with the center since 2008. Uh, with yourself and the team here. So I'm um, always excited to see you guys and to spend more time with you. Even in this time of social distancing and isolation, we can connect quickly and, and somewhat intimately here on Zoom, so. Woody has a, has a connection with the center that goes back, yeah, many years as he alluded to, uh, back in the early days, uh, just after the founding of the center when we were working on some of our first programs, Woody was involved in those for uh, uh, and has been involved in a number of years, took a hiatus, hiatus, and then uh, uh, we re-engaged him again a couple of years ago. So uh, we're, we're certainly glad to have you part of the, of the team and the extended family of, of what we do at the center. And I think that gives you a vantage point that is really helpful uh, because you understand a little bit about some of our assumptions and what we often think about and talk about. And you know, one of the things that we 
is really sent a, a core to the way that that I, that we all at the center really think about leadership is that it's this continuous ongoing process of uh, adjusting and making small changes and that the best leaders spend a lot of time continuing to get better, right? And so it's not about arriving at a place, it's about this process of continual sort of growth and challenging yourself. And I think that fits well with the idea of what you're doing now, which is the topic of executive coaching. And so we'll, we'll jump around a little bit, but I want to hear, can you, can you tell for those of uh, those folks who are listening, who uh, probably most folks have heard in one way or another of coaching or executive coaching, but I mean, what, what is that? And how does that fit into sort of this process of continual growth and development? I mean, it's a word that anyone can use, right? Yeah, coaching is interesting. It's been around a long time, and I would argue it's been around since the beginning of, of human time in some form uh, or some way, shape, or form. Uh, um, but sort of in a formal business sense, certainly in the U.S. and around the 1980s or so into the to the mid 90s, you started hearing more of this concept of a business coach, or management coach, or executive coach, and. Since then, it's evolved uh, pretty rapidly over the last couple of decades as, as a, a burgeoning field um, that's becoming more professionalized with a lot of certificate programs out there. And so one of the things that we've done at NYU is to create the first academic Master's of Science program in the U.S. for executive coaching and organizational consulting, which is a very exciting time. And, and it says a lot about where the field is evolving to. So, so to your question, what, what does that mean, right? Because anybody can just claim that they're a coach. And, you know, I think the most simple way to look at it is an executive coach is, is really a catalyst for change because anybody who's approaching a coach is looking for some sort of change or to manage or deal with some sort of change, right? Whether they want to or not, right? They're, they're dealing with this. And so what they're looking for is for someone to be a thought partner and even in some ways an accountability partner in, in moving towards that change. So when most people are looking for coaching, um, uh, a, a 2017 survey actually that was done internationally by the International Coach Federation found that there are really two major outcomes, right? It's, it's looking to, to change a behavior of some kind, right? To improve performance or productivity, or I'm looking for some sort of process change in how I do things typically and how I communicate and work with others. So, so, so the coach is there to be that executives. So you take the executives and you tell them what to do. Is that right? No, 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 no. Stay away from the advice trap, Dr. Hiller. Uh, yeah, so, right, it is, is like I jokingly call it right, the medical model, right, of, of the I'm going to diagnose and tell you what to do and go take this and be done with me. No, uh, th there is a lot of debate. C can a coach be an advisor at times? I do believe yes. Uh, there are those that are purists and do not believe that. Um, I think that the reason we, the, our program is coaching and consulting is because there is th th there is a blending of the two that does happen. But typically speaking, as a coach, it's more about being that facilitator, that guide to help them through the process. To some extent, a, either self revelation if it's sort of the process and communication challenges you're looking for reflection and learning, or if it's really in a way goal setting. Right? Is how do you help someone through the process of goal setting and keep them accountable and focused on the goals and the milestones towards making that change and what to do. You, you have to be careful. And even as a leader, and you know this, Nathan, studying leadership for so long is that it's easy to fall into that belief of I'm the stage, I'm the wise individual. Let me just tell you what to do because it's easier and faster. Um, that doesn't always take, that may help in an acute circumstance, but it usually isn't very lasting. So you want to be careful about be, the, 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 uh, the dreaded advice monster kind of jumping into your head. Yeah, and well, I think so. It, it's something that's I think really important as it relates to sort of it, to executive coaching. This idea that you are uh, helping facilitate a process, right? And it's very much the way we approach leadership development at the center, and mm -hmm. and it's disarming in some ways, right? That we when when you start uh, getting people in a room and they're saying like, what what are, what is this person going to tell me about my my job? you know, or, or how to do my job. And, it, and, and I think uh, the important thing is we're not, uh, when you are truly a developmental partner, you are not help, you are not telling someone what to do. You are helping them work through a process with some knowledge. Sometimes it may involve telling them what to do, right? But, but that, um, 
you're a process facilitator, I guess, right? And so what does, um, I mean, can't you do this by yourself? So what, I mean, so this has become really a sub-industry, I guess. And I think for many of us, right, this idea that, oh, I can help someone, but can't you, why can't we do it ourselves? Why can't we coach ourselves? Sure, it's just like uh, the same reason you can't train yourself, right, in a lot of ways. I mean, there are some things you can do on your own and some things you need extra help. And I, I like to think of coaching as, as one of many types of leader development interventions or, or way, modes of training, right? It's not it's something in itself is part of leader development. There's curriculum in course, there's reading, there's mentoring. Coaching is one way. It's that one-on-one -on -one very specific, I think, uh, element of leader development. And the reason it's important is because we are all victims of living in our own heads. And the fact is we have lots of conversations with ourselves or with other people that in our own head. And, and believing Especially in the last few months, right? We, we have- Without a doubt, we are in an era where people are having way too many conversations in here. And the problem is we, we like to believe that we're reflecting when in fact you're ruminating, right? You're, you're repeating negative narratives or you're imposing yeah. uh, what you believe someone's gonna say on them without actually having the conversation with them. And so when you have too much time, and I've worked with clients like this, where they will step back and say, Woody, you know, I was reflecting over the last several days or over the weekend, I'll say, no, no, no. If you were reflecting for more than maybe a couple hours or even a day, you were probably ruminating, right? And it's important to have someone who is, uh, there to hold you accountable and, and even obligated to hold you accountable, right? For the, the, the misfiring of thoughts that you may have or the yeah. misplacement yeah. of energy and emotion and to help call that out. Not, not someone who's gonna punch you in the face or get aggressive, but it's to be your partner to help you think out loud and test some of those thoughts and test some of those ideas and help you think about them in a healthy way and then devise a strategy for actually approaching it in reality, not just in your head. That's, uh, I think that's, it's really great. Something that also, so reflection versus rumination is really key, right? So we want to be reflective, but how do we avoid ruminating? And when it's just a conversation with ourselves in our head, we, we, uh, we may be ruminating. Uh, that's, that's really, those are great thoughts. That's a great distinction. And, and I, I like that a lot. Well, once you're replaying the conversation, probably after like the third time, you need to start thinking about, okay, what am I getting out of this exercise, right? Yeah. Am I getting anywhere or I do, do I just sort of feel good about it, but, but in an unhealthy way, you know? So, so it's anything you want to think about, what's the prize for this activity or the behavior or, or what's, what's the, the negative of it, right? And then what's the loss that I'm getting, the time the increase in heart rate, the, the need to have an extra drink because I can't deal with this anymore. I mean, start thinking about how those negative thoughts and spiraling and repetition may be driving other negative behaviors. So it's important to pay attention to that and kind of use those as triggers. That's, I, 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 um, I, I, I think the, the whole uh, field of executive coaching is fascinating because it's turned into this industry because there's value, I think, right? Because there's their, their senior executives see value in this. One of the reasons also is that there are many conversations that they can't have with anyone in their workplace, right? Because they may be in a position where they, they just can't and they need that trusted partner who is sort of on call, who isn't connected to those people, who isn't somehow, I mean, it, it's one of the things that you continually hear from leaders as you move up the organizational change, how at, at organizational chain, how lonely it is, how lonely it is at the top. And, and even for people uh, who've been senior executives, then you move up again. If you move up to a, a, a top senior executive role or a CEO role, um, it's even more lonely again from there. And there's a fewer subset of people. So I, I think it's, um, there's clearly this, you know, really interesting need. I, 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 so I want to talk about loneliness here in a minute, just as a general phenomenon, mm -hmm. but also, um, I'm struck by this idea of, so we've been talking a little bit about coaching in the context of senior executives, but a lot of these principles and ideas play out and can be useful for anyone 
even if you're managing people on the front lines, or even if you're not officially managing them, uh, and you're just looking to have better uh, conversations, what are some of the what are some of the um, skills or tips or or things that anyone, regardless of your position, whether you want to be an executive coach, whether you are an executive coach, for, forget that for a minute. What what are some things that anyone can use that are principles or ideas from the coaching world that might help us? And I'll, I'll, before I get into that, I do want to point this out. You know, I had uh, I remember years ago the the president of a pharmaceutical company based in in New Jersey once sat me down when he was uh, bringing me on board to work with him uh, and some stuff they were going through. He said, Woody, you can ask the questions, but I can't because it's different coming from someone other than their boss. And that is an important thing. And that is part of the value of an executive coach, particularly in circumstances where you're trying to flush out what's going on and people's reactions to you as a leader. Now that said, that doesn't mean that there are valuable, I think, skills that any leader can use um, in lieu of having a coach uh, for their people, right? So, you, you know, uh, the one big thing I think that's grown is executive coaching as a profession, but also is the skill sets that executive coaches have and, and develop that you can utilize yeah. as a meal, right? To have these conversations. Because right now, we're, we're in a very unprecedented, unique, crazy situation, right? We've heard it a million times before. And, and it's interesting to think, I, I, I took a look at a, a, stu a study that Cigna did back in uh, January. So, so in the social era of humanity, pre-COVID, when we still were all around each other, and they found that 61% of Americans reported being lonely. Now, this is before, right, before the shelter in place has started to go into effect in California, then in New York, New Jersey, and then all around the country. Are, are you, can we pause on that for a minute? Yeah, sixty-one percent of Americans are lonely, and that and that is that. I don't know what the figures are, but they've been tracking this for a while, and it's it's never been this high pre-COVID, 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 and now. And I haven't seen anything recently. I mean, there have been spotty surveys here and there, but but you know, for example, uh, a study from Ginger, which is an EAP provider, they found that. 69% of folks are saying in their, in their network, right, of, of clients are saying that this is the most career stress they've ever felt. And that was across all age groups, okay? all age groups. So people have been through lots of different things. They also found that 62% of folks are saying they've lost at least an hour a day of productivity working from home. And a third have lost more than two hours a day of productivity working from home, quote, working from home. I, I, I like to make the correction that this is not working from home. This yeah. is working in isolation, either by yourself for a lot of younger folks, particularly, or it's working in confinement together with family members of varying ages, right? Which is another challenge yeah. that you have. I, I heard things, a great you know, clip on this lonely. of, uh, we're not working from home, we're living in our office. Right. <laughs> It's, it's the kind of blend that we've never had to deal with before, right? We've always talked about work-life balance. I've always thought it's a silly concept, you know, in, in the digital mobile age because you, you can't really be truly balanced. But now it is literally blended. Like, you notice my three-year-old will walk in into a meeting. My wife and I are juggling back and forth. Once I jump on this, I grab him. She grabs him uh, after the next call. And, and, and then, you know, I have my mother here helping us out. So it becomes this crazy blend of work and life that just – there's no black and white on and off, right? And so this is what's important. As a leader, you need to understand that everyone is feeling more lonely, feeling more stressed universally, right? There's no doubt there, but they're all experiencing it in different ways because our home situations are, a lot of them are very different. Like again, if you're young and isolated by yourself, I work with some folks who haven't seen other people or even had human touch in months, right? Uh, maybe they've seen them from their window or from afar. So that's isolating. They're also feeling detached from their teams, right? Because you no longer have those physical cues of culture, uh, of reminders of what we do and our mission because you're in your room, your home. So you're constantly reminded about those home distractions, less about the work distractions. So I, I just wanted to clarify, this is not some kind of boon to productivity, right? Because we don't have commutes anymore. We just put our slippers on and work. Not, that, that's not happening. And yeah. so as leaders, to your point earlier, how do you have conversations with each individual to better get to know them 
and understand their circumstances. Because without understanding those circumstances, you're not gonna be able to help them uh, and really dig in. And so I think there are, there are tools and techniques that coaches use that I think could help any, any manager or leader. Is it, uh, I, I love it. We heard, uh, we just had a comment from, uh, from Kristen who said, I found the opposite. I've been extremely productive working remotely. And I think this gets to this uh, bifurcation that's going on, right? That, that the way people are experiencing this is so vastly different. And, um, you know, some people are still in, in the, you know, the morning phase of this. And, and I mean, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. I mean, you, you know, so people, people's uh, um, tendency to the way they handle it as well as their situation. And I don't mean handling it better or worse. I just mean how the stages that they're going through, uh, like some people are, are thrilled that this is might, maybe this is going to usher in a, a, a new age. And, and for some people, you're experiencing all of those, right? That it's exciting. Um, there is sort of this hope, wow, there's some realizations and it also stinks. All of, and, and it can do that all in the same day. And that's what's so challenging, right? And for some people, they're more likely to have more of those positive. And some people are, are really in the weeds, uh, for, particularly for people who are, you know, take, taking, care of, uh, taking care of elderly parents or, you know, have had serious disruptions uh, or have kids. And um, some people have had serious disruptions to their, uh, uh, to their life in terms of time. And then others, it, it could look, uh, you know, more on the lonely factor. I mean, I think that's what's so striking about this is that for so many of us, there's been such significant change in, a, in an amount of time. It's hard to imagine that three months ago, three months ago, we, we didn't really have any idea. I mean, I mean, there were a few people that thought this might be big, who th really, but <laughs> for society at large, three months ago, how the world has changed in the last 90 days. Uh, it's, so it's here's pretty something remarkable, right? Throw at you, right? When you talk about the bifurcation, I mean, I think there is really a range here, right? I think far, part of it depends on like the age of children that you have at home uh, and the level of help, right, that you may have. Uh, if it's two working parents versus one working parent. Um, and I also think, how do you measure and look at productivity or performance? Um, maybe you feel productive and, and you're performing. I don't know what the actual gauge of that is, right? But there is interesting data that says to the other side. So, and, and that's why, to my point, yeah, there are some things that I definitely get done much better when I'm at home. But I could tell you when I worked from home for 15 years, that was different than this, right? This is not working from home. Like I could go to Starbucks, I could go to find places, I could get, I, we had help, uh, childcare and other ways of helping us. So it's important to, to make that distinction first, but that's why I truly believe uh, that you need to ask your individual folks, you need to find out. So like, as an example, the company my wife works for, they've been polling everybody, all the employees to find out when would you like to come back and, and what does that look like? Because they found that some people actually don't have to be back in the office. Now they're doing that not just, just to accommodate folks, but because also capacity is going to be greatly reduced in a lot of these facilities, right? Because of social distancing rules and also because of entry and egress, right? With lines and everything. So they, they kind of want people to stay home. You probably heard Jack Dorsey said people from Twitter, if they want to work from home, they can do it forever. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said he expects maybe 50% of people not to come back. Um, but and, I think that's predicated that on child care, right, for a lot of people. And so if you don't have other uh, types of what, schooling, child care, and other uh, programs re reopening, it may not allow you to work at home in a more productive and healthy way. So, and again, that's why we need to yeah. get into it. How do, you, how do you as a leader treat everybody individually? because everyone's going through something a little bit differently. Like some people say, hey, I've done well. Uh, others say, look, this has been hard for me. And guess what? This is a transition period, right? We're seeing reopenings going on all across the country right now in, in various forms. And so what does that mean? Because what I'm going back to is not the same as what I left, right? And it's not gonna be the same as what I have now. So how do we, but again, as leaders, you need to start having those conversations to, to help accommodate everybody to make them feel, feel like they can work with it.
that's this is this is great and I, I love it there's there's some of the pre comments before and some of the comments in the chat here uh, that I'm seeing just just exactly speak to this that you know some people don't want to go back to the office and some people are are more productive and you know there's there's of course uh, that variability and you know we don't have commutes and we don't have uh, we don't have long conversations around the water cooler where you're where you're uh, being sort of uh, whether you like it or not, you know, someone is speaking to you and you don't really have a choice. Um, I think the interesting thing is over the long term, some of those impromptu informal conversations as frustrating as they are also provide us with knowledge that we don't know, knowledge or insight or like they help solidify networks. And so I think in the long term, there's definitely some costs to this right, that, that, that individuals as well as organizations will face, even if I might prefer it, it's hard for me to, to learn in an impromptu way what someone heard about something that might affect our industry from a, you know, unless you're in a meeting with them and they say that, but those water cooler conversations, some of those also don't happen, right? So it's, it'll be interesting. But let, I wanna get to uh, a question from Paulette from, uh, from Jackson Health. So thank you, for Paulette, for submitting this question. Her question was, how do you help people overcome objections to change? So let's, maybe we, we can probably take this out of the COVID context. Just in general, if you're giving advice to, uh, to folks, what does that look like if you take, if you, if you were to help guide someone through how they might help uh, overcome objections to change? Uh, well, objection to change is nothing new. <laughs> that, that's, that's a human phenomenon that's been going on forever. Um, the interesting thing I would say is right now, we all went through forced change, like change that we didn't have <laughs> any alternative or options to do anything different. We had to go through the change of sheltering in place, staying at home. And if you've noticed, that change in behavior has been very difficult, right? Just the idea of wearing masks seems very difficult for people. Just the idea of not going out in public seems very difficult, right? It's a, so we've seen play out a mass global need for behavior change in some ways an imposed behavior change that, that's starting to ease now. Uh, so my point is this, is behavior change is always difficult and, and that's what we're talking about. Any kind of change really means there's some kind of behavioral change that's coming with it, right? Um, so I think the, the, the question is to find out, again, it's how do you have that conversation where you first build trust and you inquire in a curious way, like what is it sp specifically, right? That is causing you any anxiety or what, what is the barrier that you see in, into getting to work? Because you wanna have specific conversations about what, how they view the change because it may be that they're misunderstanding it. Uh, it may be that you can make adjustments or alterations. So if it's like, well, I have to come back to the office starting tomorrow and look, going back to the office, you're gonna to have to go through changes, whether you like it or not. You may have to do temperature checks, you may have to do distancing in lines, you may have to do what I call now white collar shift work, which is basically gonna be, uh, you'll go in and roll in shifts at different times with capacity yeah, right. reduction. So, so, so white collar workers who typically work nine to five, eight to four, right? We're talking about rolling shifts now. Possibly, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've in, seen everything. In some, in some environments, right? In some, in, in, yeah. in some places, right? Yeah. Well, because of capacity in facilities, right? Like I look at New York, uh, our capacity, in, I mean, in just NYU's facilities is, it, it, you can't go right back to 100% and, and, and abide by distancing rules. In, right? those, in those tiny elevators that were built in, you know, like 1920 that-, that Oh, are, New York City, yeah. And the capacity must be like one per, uh, one per person if, in a COVID era. Yeah, I, I don't know, right? But, yeah. but back to the question is, is you want to dig in and it's never about the first question from a coaching perspective, right? First, you always want to demonstrate genuine actual interest. So you don't want to ask a question just for the sake of checking a box when you're really trying to talk to somebody. So that means avoiding rote questions like, hey, how are you? How's your day? How are things going? That's a check that that's a nonsense question, right? Those are pre-programmed things that we just throw out there. Mm -hmm. Usually not very helpful because it'll get a rote response. So you want to ask specifically about, you know, if it's What's going well today? If you want to build on a positive, what, what specifically are you working on that, that you may need help with? What's a barrier um, that, you know, in your day or a frustration? And then, but it's never about the first question, right? So that's to get somebody yeah. started. Right, and, right. The, the presenting the problem versus the underlying problem. Right? I, I wonder, so what do you think? Classic psychology. I, I've, been, I've, been renting, I, I've been wrestling with this 
with this um, sort of idea for a while, and, and, and I can't claim that it, it's necessarily mine, but I've, I've had this observation that uh, managers who love to tout the fact that they have an open door policy um, are usually missing something. And, and my, my theory goes something like this, and it, I'm, not, I'm not knocking the idea of an open door policy, but when people sort of say, oh, I have an open door policy, people can come talk to me whenever they want. It's, it's exactly this issue of, it, but are you asking the questions? Because sometimes people can go talk to you, but they don't feel comfortable going to talk to you. And if you're not doing the investigating, you're putting all the onus on people to come talk to you. And they may know you can walk in, uh, they can walk into your office, but you're gonna look at them a certain way, or you're gonna, you know, sort of, there's a difference then between that and actually being an investigator, right, as a, as, as a leader and, and asking some of those questions that are, you know, what can I really do to help you become more productive and being proactive, right? So there's some sense in which sometimes people saying, claiming they have an open door policy is uh, it, there, there, there's like a needed shift that they need to move from kind of, I'm doing this thing so that people can come to me and they're not going to their team. And that, that, especially in this era, I think is really important, right? That, that managers need to be proactive in yes. actually making those connections. Well, and because you, you can't have those organic conversations, like you mentioned, where you bump into somebody in the hall or you just grab them at their desk or you go for a coffee or get lunch. And, and you can't have an open Zoom policy because no one's just going to come Zoom at you. You need to Zoom at that, right? So I agree with you. You have to be proactive. You got to say, hey, look, you've got to schedule the time because I know that doing a Zoom or a phone call feels more transactional a lot of times. It's more scheduled. It's, it, but don't have an agenda. Right? Do these where you just get on and you're just going to talk to them like a human being. And like you said, be the investigator. Be curious. Avoid the rote pleasantry type questions because those are just fillers in air. And, and if you know the individual, I can't prescribe what specifically to ask about, but be specific. But always remember, it's not about the first question, right? It's the, all right, and tell me a little bit more. All right, and what else is there, right? Is there any, any more to it? And it'll be the third time you do that where you start digging into um, where the person's really willing to share what's actually going on, right? And I think you- uh, And it, it may take a few times because we're, you, what you don't wanna do is as the boss, right? They, they're looking to you to judge them, right? They know you're judging. And no, none of us like to be judged, but we have that feeling. You're, our, you're the one who rates our performance. You're the one who decides if I'm promoted. So. Suspend your judgments, but also avoid, like what you said earlier, that whole advice trap, right? Get them to talk. You're trying to glean it, pull it out of them. That's what a coach does is get the information out, not just go the first top line thing that jumps out. I'm going to attack that and give you advice because you're too, it's too superficial. You're not there. And you haven't built any trust with the individual to, to share with you judgment-free, advice-free. And... I do think it's important to show vulnerability and share a little bit about what you've gone through, but just don't, don't make it about you. Don't hijack the conversation and go into your own rant about yourself. So there's a fine line about sharing enough to show vulnerability, but at the same time, make sure you're using that as a prompt to ask more and make them feel more comfortable to share with you. Otherwise it becomes about you and they're like, Oh God, here we go. I got to listen to my boss. Tell me about himself right now. So so that, that's just a way to kind of use the, the sort of stepped questioning technique of a coach. I love, and I think you had a book recommendation related to questions. Can you, can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah. So there are a lot of coaching books out there. I mean, there are way too many coaching books, but this is not a coaching book, but I thought it was really interesting, written by a journalist. It was called A More Beautiful Question. Uh, and he did a follow-up book. I think it's um, Book of Beautiful Questions. But so it, it it's a cool way to think from a journalist's perspective of how you dig in for different types of conversations. Like if I'm trying to build rapport, if I'm trying to investigate, I'm trying to create connections, it, you know, because journalists have to do this. They have to build trust and rapport very quickly and get information and make, and stay out of the way and make it not about themselves. So it's a good non-coach kind of way of approaching uh, how do you ask questions. That's, that's great. And who's the author of that one? Warren Berger. Great. We'll, uh, we'll make sure to, to uh, uh, we'll post that in the comments here uh, in, in a moment. But uh, that was Woody's, we were asking for uh, book recommendations and that was Woody's 
uh, recommendation. So uh, helpful, right? Regardless of whether you're in the context of a uh, of, of actually officially coaching or or not, but just how do we ask better questions? I think, boy, is that a useful skill for all of us to have, regardless in the context of any relationship you have, right? <laughs> even even if it's not in the context of work uh, work or not, of thinking through how do we how do we ask better questions? I love it. I love it. What um, so. Some of you I know who are on this chat uh, know and and uh, have uh, seen Dr. Woody before. He has appeared on nationally televised programs. He has appeared on a lot of uh, local programs in New York, kind of a bit up all over. He was doing some work for EY, uh, interviewing, and and what to me is fascinating is you've had the you've had a chance to interview some really amazing folks. Uh, can you tell us about one or two of those that were particularly um, that were particularly interesting? Like I know you have a, a, a good relationship with the founder of Kind Bars, uh, for example. And I just, I mean, there's so many fascinating conversations that you've had a chance to have. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that interview sticks in my mind. Um, I don't know Dan very well, but we've met a couple times and, and he's a really wonderful human being, Dan Lubitsky, the, the founder of Kind Healthy Snacks. Uh, this is interesting, I did an interview with him recently for a, a piece I wrote on Thrive Global. And one of the things he said to me, I asked him what's been part of the toughest thing as a leader. And he said, not being in the presence of my people and not being able to see their faces uh, in front of me in a room and to feel the energy that I get from them that inspires me, excites me and makes me feel more creative and innovative. And he said, that's been the hardest thing that he says he feels he hasn't been able to recreate over, uh, over Zoom uh, and he can't wait to get back to that. So that was an interesting tidbit from him. I also, I, I got a chance to speak with Sarah Kaus, the founder of Swell Bottle. I know knows Swell Bottle. Uh, they're also based in New York. And she said her toughest thing has also been keeping people connected, but she's found that doing you know, regular Zoom calls has actually been very insightful. But and even with her vendors and business relationships, because she said, I get to peek into people's homes and get a feel for like their life and <laughs> what they're projecting, unless it's a fake background. And so, it, it, you know, kids come jumping in. She has a three-year-old also. And so it's, it, it's made it a little more fun and casual and lighthearted. So she's found that to be a positive, you know, of course, a lot well, of negative. That, and you can't see my home. We can see, of course, see your, uh, your home where you're at now, but this, uh, this was a particularly beautiful flight that I had flying from Miami to Puerto Rico uh, with just the most incredible clouds. And uh, so I'm reminded of that. And it tells, tells you a little bit uh, about me and what, uh, you know, sort of, uh, so, so maybe that's interesting. Uh, what, you know, what, not, not a really meaningful, deep question, but, you know, ask people about their Zoom background. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's um, even, even someone who now rates media people's Zoom backgrounds. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you, um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've done? So what are some of the challenges you've had when you have worked with executives? So when you have been in the coaching role, um, what, like, what are some of the things that you really had to learn or that were, wow, like just really stuck out to you? as uh, useful skills or like, what does that look like in a, in a practical level? Can you tell us any stories without, of course, breaking confidentiality, what sure. that looked like? I think, uh, remember, you're not an expert in their business um, and don't be expected to be an expert in their business. You may have industry background that's relevant, right? That's knowledgeable, but you're not gonna be where they are. Um, and don't, don't try to, to play it as you understand the business. Your, your job is to be the coach, right? And is to facilitate conversations uh, and be cautious about stepping in and wanting to give business advice at times because you're not going to have that credibility. Um, I found that early on. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of a lot of mistakes I've probably made in my life uh, when you interject in those sort of things. I think the other is how do you keep on track because some of these individuals have a lot going on. And so they want to shift and they'll pivot and move all over the place, especially entrepreneurs who are just used to constantly being agile and adapting. And sometimes you could be too agile and too adaptive. And you, 
the behavior changes that may be fundamental to helping them develop and be successful uh, are things you need to stick to. And sometimes you may be tempted to pivot off because they have a particular acute circumstance they need you to help deal with. And maybe you do need to help them deal with it, but you also have to say, but as well as we have to still continue the work on what we're doing, right? It's easier when you're on retainer than, than sort of the hourly kind of model, I guess, to do that, which has sort of been. Right. So there are different models of coaching. One is like per hour, which is right. not the preferred, you know, sort of not, not the ideal way. It's, it's uh, where, you, where you're sort of on call a little bit more. Right. Uh, so on a retainer, right, per month or per per engagement, right? Right. So so keeping them on track, but also feeling like you're delivering. Um, and, and sometimes it's hard to know uh, what are those outcomes. And and I think part of it is making sure that you do try to identify what are those tangible goals you're trying to reach. What will that look like in some kind of measure or or in something beyond feeling good? Um, because sometimes feeling good may not may help the individual, but it may not help the business. And a lot of times you're on the hook for helping the business uh, as well as the individual or helping the individual so as to help the business. Uh, so it's important to know what is the business outcome you're trying to drive them towards by changing or modifying their behavior. If that makes I, sense. Uh, no, this, this, is, this is great. And I love the fact, I'm looking at the chat here uh, and I love, thank you for so many of these great comments and, and uh, uh, and questions and other things. I wish we could get to all of them. I see a, uh, a comment from Dr. Marie Barnes, who is actually uh, a faculty member in the program that uh, you graduated from uh, in industrial organizational psychology. Uh, but in a previous life, she was uh, she worked at Baptist Health South Florida, and uh, in a lot of that, that role, she was an executive. Uh, she did executive coaching, and so executive can mean you know doesn't have to mean just senior executives. It's the context of sort of leadership coaching, right, in, the, in a professional context. And she did, I think, up, all, all the way up and down the chain. Uh, but she has, has a comment here that said, I really see coaching as an other-centered experience. And I think that's, um, that's really interesting that, you know, it, it, it is all about the other person, right? And uh, who yes. doesn't like to talk about themselves? Well, well, of course, and you know, there's like transference if you get into counseling and therapy, right, and all those other challenges. You you have to be aware, um, and in in part of coach training, you have observed, you know, uh, sessions where they help you understand if you are infringing too much, and uh, I think that's important. I also wanted I saw Rose Angel put a question up here, which I thought was a good one about about matching coach to client. Mm, okay. Very important. Um, so we, we partner uh, at NYU with the International Coach Federation on a conference every year. It was the last human contact conference I went to back in on March 2nd that we hosted. And we had Accenture's head of global diversity come and speak about her challenges being mismatched with someone who did not understand her culture, her ethnicity, her, her socioeconomic background early in life and the, and the stuff that she had to go through. So, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, should a coach really be kind of other centered, right, uh, um, as Marie said, but I think there is some kind of relatability factor that is important. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, and, right, not, not every person, not every coach will work with every person well, right, you know no, that. No. And, we, and we, boy, do we ever see this in our programs, and you've done also some coaching for us in some of our programs where we, uh, in our, you know, three and four multi-day programs, we'll pair people in our program with an executive coach for an hour, and so many times, uh, and we, we really, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about who to pair with whom, and we know our coaches well. And so as we get to know the participants, we spend a lot of time saying, I think this person would be really good with this person. And, and uh, it, it's amazing. We've gotten pretty good at it. And, and, uh, uh, and props to Shannon, who oftentimes just does it, uh, you know, can, can uh, come up with a, a really good <laughs> list that we just then all collectively meet and talk about. But um, I, I, someone will come to us after and say, wow, I just, I had the most amazing experience in an hour. Uh, did you, did you purposely pair me with that coach? And it, absolutely, we absolutely did because we know what some of our coaches are good at work, you know, what type of person they work with, but also what, what sort of kinds of issues or concerns that they work with. And I think that's, uh, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I want to ask for the folks who are out here, 
Uh, I want to shift gears as we as we sort of wrap up. Uh, I want to ask some folks, what are some of the things I'm really curious about this that you're doing to keep your sanity small or large uh, that you've been doing in the last few uh, in the last few months? I think we all have uh, something something or things we're doing that that might look a little different. So I uh, would love to hear about some of those and uh, whether I don't know if you saw the first one, Woody, but uh, it is time for the sneaky snacky squirrel game. So how it works is I will spin this spinner and where it lands will determine the question that we ask you uh, coming up. So it's a bit of a wild card. It could be, you know, could be any type of uh, any type of question here. So uh, let me see if I can get a good spin of it here. And you landed on the blue, on the blue. So I'm wearing blue. Our blue, yes, uh, our blue, blue question you blue. for you today is, is related to your, uh, your love of fishing. So uh, Woody, Woody is a, uh, uh, I don't know, avid fisherman, but a, a hobbyist. No, not really. Fisherman, I'm pretty terrible fisherman, at it. Right? So, so um, where would you rather fish? Would you rather fish in Biscayne Bay as you used to with your kayak? In, in, South, uh, in South Florida or in the Chesapeake Bay area, which is where you're at now. Tell us about that. Oh my God, it's like picking your favorite child, you know? Um, so for, first of all, I, I wouldn't say avid. I, I would say I'm, I'm a very much a novice. I uh, used to fish off my kayak that I rigged up uh, one summer living in, uh, in Miami when I was at FIU and uh, got pretty decent at going out for Virginia Key and fishing in the mangroves and so snow. fishing yeah. from your kayak. From my kayak, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which before it was a thing, I want to make that clear. That was totally before it was a thing. Um, you, but here in the Chesapeake Bay, where, where I spent time growing up, and we, we have striped bass here and others, which I, I've yet to catch one this year because I, I really do uh, pretty much suck at fishing here. But, um, but I've got a, a boat, so that makes it a lot easier to turn the engine on and drive instead of the hard work of a kayak. So I probably prefer this kind of fishing now. It's a little more social with my family, but you know, Quarantine together on the boat is kind of an isolating but fun experience. So, uh, you know, I, I love both. I miss I miss being in South Florida, of course, but uh, the Chesapeake Bay is a phenomenal uh, uh, place to be. So I love it. Well, thank you for those of you who also responded about uh, the things that you do to keep your sanity. I see structure, keeping busy, and my favorite one of all is by a guy named Matthew Bennett, who is claiming that he uh, goat yoga is what helps him keep his sanity. And, uh, or boiling peanuts, I feel like, but yeah. Uh, so he, um, he, is, he is doing goat yoga, but uh, I think he's just kidding. And uh, I think I know who this Matthew Bennett is. And uh, um, that, that is, uh, that, that's the kind of, uh, kind of response I would uh, expect. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I uh, uh, love it. We, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today and share with some of your uh, wisdom and insights around coaching, but more broadly around uh, development. So, so thank you, Dr. Woody, for being with us. Um, I want to encourage all of you who are here uh, joining us today to just think about what, what's one small tweak you can make that might make you become more effective. And it's not about grandiose changes, but what's one thing that we can do uh, every day? And, and for each of us, that's going to look a little bit different. But what does it look like today? How can you have a slightly better day? And then what can you do to help grow yourself? And that might just be just switching up a routine a little bit or doing something just a little bit differently to gain some uh, insights and wisdom. But thank you for your recommendations. Any closing thoughts? I, I, to, to piggyback on that, I say just think of little experiments you could do. Little experiments to try something different that may surprise you and you may discover something, a change that you might want to continue to try. So think of it from an experimental perspective. But uh, hey, it's been great being here. Good to see you. Good to see the whole team. And uh, thank you to everybody for, for coming on and, and humoring us. Thank, thank you, Dr. Woody. And thank you all. Uh, again, connect with the center. We'd love to, to have you uh, all stay connected uh, with, the, with the center. And thank you for submitting your questions and being such a fantastic uh, webcast audience. Thank you again, doc, the, the incomparable Dr. Michael Woodward, and uh, ha have a great rest of your week, everyone. Be well, stay safe. <laughs>